Hello, and welcome to Thirst for Equality. I'm Sarah Walsh, the 2018 president of Columbus Realtors, and together with Sharice Smoot Johnson, the 2018 president of Columbus Realtist, we welcome you. Thirst for Equality is a collaboration between Columbus Realtors and Columbus Realtist. We gratefully acknowledge the generous support of our promotional partners, and additionally, we'd like to thank the many volunteers who enabled Columbus Realtors and Columbus Realtists to fulfill our mission and celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. Thirst for Equality was made possible by a grant from the National Association of Realtors and the staff support of Columbus Realtors. And now, Thirst for Equality. Mr. Holstis, will the city be presenting a closing argument? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. Members of the jury, I'd like to start by thanking you for the work you've done in the past three weeks, listening carefully to the evidence. I'd like to thank you as well for your work you're, you're doing in deliberating on these matters. Without your careful consideration, this system would not function. I'd like to thank you as well, Judge Marbley, the topic we have spent the last several weeks debating is not a pleasant one, nor is it an easy one. This is a complicated issue, and it is all too easy to try and make complicated issues simple by stripping them of nuance. That's why you're here, members of the jury, to make sure that nuance is seen. In cases like this, we naturally seek someone to blame. Mr. Kennedy says that he hasn't had access to water. We look for who's at fault. Ms. Hairston tells you that she has, she has to carry water in from town, and we go looking for the person we can point the finger at. The last thing anyone wants to do is tell the children of these plaintiffs that their parents are the ones responsible for the state of their neighborhood. Because the sad fact of the matter, members of the jury, is that plaintiffs do bear the burden of their own choices. As much as they tried to tell you that this was a cause of discrimination, what you've got to remember is that they had to prove there was discrimination. They couldn't just get up here and say it. They had to give you your proof that there's discrimination going on. And they had to give you proof that they suffered as a result of this supposed discrimination. They have to show that real harm was done. The residents of Coral Run simply don't have that proof. The folks running the city of Zanesville are good people. They're, act, they're not racist, and they don't discriminate. If there really was discrimination, if there really was damage, don't you think it would have been more obvious? This scene is the plaintiff's first witness. You may call your witness. Good morning, I'm well. Could you please state your full name for the record? My name is Cynthia Harrison. And Ms. Harrison, how long have you lived in Coal Run? All my life. I was born there, and I suppose I'll die there. Have you uh, ever had running water at your home in Coal Run? Never. We put a cement cistern in a while back but we still have to truck the water in once every couple of weeks. Do you know if your, any of your neighbors have running water, Ms. Harrison? A couple of them do. Let me ask this, Ms. Harrison, about, about how many people live in Coal Run? Maybe 100. And how many of them would you say have running water? Five or six. Just some of the new folk who moved, re, moved in recently, white folk. Now, you, said, you said some of the white folks? Yes, sir. A couple of the richer white folks got running water, but everyone else uses buckets and barrels. Um, how many of Coal Run's approximately 100 residents would you say are white, Ms. Harrison? Not very many. To be honest with you, Coal Run is mostly black. Some biracial, like myself. I know the Kennedys have got some native in them, too. We're a diverse neighborhood. How much do you know about the areas around Coal Run? 
a fair amount. Like I said, I've lived there all my whole life. Are the areas around Coal Run mostly black? <laughs> no. We're the only little pocket of color. Rural Ohio doesn't have much in the way of pigmentation. Uh, do you know if the areas around Coal Run have running water? Sure they do. Everywhere but Coal Run. Well, you said rural Ohio, Ms. Hairston. Surely there aren't, you know, many others around where you live. Well, actually, sir, we've got a whole lot of little neighboring townships and villages. None are very big, mind you, but there's a far few little towns. But the water just stops at the edge of these towns? Yes, sir. The pipes end less than a quarter of a mile from my front line. Once you get within spitting distance of black folk, the city of Zanesville suddenly can't pipe water. Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Mr. Coldis, please control your, your witness. Apologies, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Harrison, I'd like to show you a picture. Would you recognize a map of the area you live if I showed it to you? I'm sure I would. And would you be able to identify which houses have black families and which houses have white families? Yes, sir. Um, I'm approaching the witness, Your Honor, uh, with Plaintiff's Exhibit J. You may. Uh, you had a chance to look at that? I have. Okay. Um, Ms. Harrison, could you tell the court what it is that I just handed you? Um, this is a map of Cold Run. The little houses colored black have black families in them, and the ones colored white have white families in them. Uh, thank you. Uh, permission to publish to the jury, Your Honor? You may. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harrison, is this map the same one that you're looking at? Well, it's definitely bigger, but it's the same. And Ms. Harrison, there is a black line uh, on, this, on this document that you see there. Um, do, do you know what that line means? Yes, sir. Um, the water stops running just about there. All the houses, and, and then all of these houses get running water. The black folks, we got to share with the rats and the roaches. Well, I want to ask you what you mean by that, Ms. Harrison. But, but first, um, when, you, when you say you have to share water with rats and roaches, uh, what are you talking about? Just what it sounds like, sir. If you don't have running water, you got to get it somewhere else. We can't drill wells because the groundwater has been polluted by all the coal mining. The groundwater is orange, sir. Instead, we buy our water and we store it as long as we can. Uh, so when you say store the water? Yes, sir. Um, we have a couple of rain barrels. Some lucky families got cisterns. We used to have a metal tank until it started to rust and the water started to taste like iron. So uh, when, when you get up in the morning, how would you brush your teeth? Bottle of water. Um, and what about cooking breakfast? Water from the barrel. Um, and washing dishes? Barrel. Um, drinking water? Bottled. Laundry? Now that's a tricky one. We usually just try to wait until it rains. It's hard to get things clean properly in cold run. What about a shower or a bath? Objection, Your Honor. Unnecessarily cumulative. Counsel, is this witness going to discuss every single use of water every morning and every night? Can we speed this up a bit? I, I understand, Your Honor, but this really goes directly to damages. This witness is explaining to the jury what it's like to not have running water, and most people can't imagine what that's like. Uh, for the plaintiff to prove our damages, I mean, we have to show the real-life consequences of the failure to provide these individuals with water. And, and, and there's trauma. 
uh, that comes with not being able to do laundry unless it's raining, and there's trauma with not being able to bathe unless you pay a buck fifty for every gallon of water. All right, I see. Oh, overruled, but can you speed it up just a little bit? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I will. Um, uh, Ms. Harrison, uh, how are you personally affected by the lack of water? Life without water, Mr. Colfax, is miserable. Imagine going whole weeks feeling thirsty. Imagine telling your kids they can't have clean clothes because you ain't got no water. Imagine pinching pennies every day so you can afford the stuff that other people expect to be free. It's like living in a third world country. Honestly, I thought the effects it would have would be obvious. Don't, Don't you, you think, think it, it would, would be, be obvious? obvious? Your Honor, may I continue with my clothes? You may, sir. Don't you think it would be obvious? So you may be wondering why exactly didn't the city of Zanesville provide water to the people of Coal Run? If not discrimination, what's the reasoning? The answer has three parts. Location, there's cost, and knowledge. First, the city of Zanesville didn't provide water outside of the city of Zanesville. Are we going to hold this city accountable for the drought in Mississippi or Texas? What about Kenya? Is it Zanesville's job to deliver water to Africa as well? Members of the jury, there's no disputing the fact that Coal Run is simply outside of the borders of the city of Zanesville. The city then cannot be held accountable for failing to deliver a service to people they are not bound to serve. This is the plaintiff's second witness now. You may call your witness. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Kennedy. Morning. Mr. Kennedy, how far do you live from Zanesville? A couple of miles. We head into town most every day. It was where most of us in Coal Run work. Now the mine is gone. Okay. Is Coal Run a part of Zanesville? No, ma'am. We're an independent town, our own little township. I'm confused, Mr. Kennedy. If Coal Run isn't a part of Zanesville, why should they be made to provide water? They're the ones who've got the water, ma'am. What do you mean? The whole area around Zanesville and Coal Run has polluted by, by the coal, been polluted by the coal industry. It isn't safe to drink the water straight out of the ground. It needs to go through a treatment plant first. The city of Zanesville, the ones who've got the plant, they run the water. Can Coal Run build their own plant? No, ma'am. It's too expensive. How so? How so? It's too expensive, way too expensive for the 100 or so people in Coal Run. Not to mention we shouldn't have to. Zanesville gives, us, gives water to everyone else, just not us. Mr. Kennedy, I'm going to hand you a copy of a map. Tell me if you recognize it, okay? Okay. May I publish, Your Honor? You may. Would you take a look at that, please? Yes. Can you tell me where the water is or where coal run? Yes. All over the place, ma'am. You can see the blue line that shows where the water goes up. That's a good 15 miles past Coal Run. They just skip right over us. Zanesville delivers water to Washington Township, way up there. They deliver water to Union Township, way out east. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Does that seem right to you? No, sir. Your Honor. May I continue with my clothes? You may. Does it seem right to you that Zanesville be forced to deliver water outside of the city limits? And yet members of the jury, even if Zanesville had wanted to provide water to Coal Run, the costs were just prohibitively high. The good tax-paying citizens of Zanesville are already footing the bill for a water treatment plant. Should they foot the bill as well for all of the piping and construction required to deliver water to Coal Run? How many hundreds of thousands of dollars would it cost for this little project? 
Not to mention, of course, that Coal Run is a tiny little hamlet without infrastructure in place to allow for water to be delivered. The city of Zanesville would have to, run, ha, ha, would have to start from scratch, building infrastructure from the ground up. The cost was just too high. The next scene will be the plaintiff's third witness. Ms. Lewis, what's your role in all of this? I'm a resident of Coal Run, and I'm also our resident math whiz. I've always been pretty good with, with numbers, so when the community needed someone to put together some spreadsheets and things to keep track of cost, I volunteered. Okay. What costs were you keeping track of? A lot of things that had to do with water. I kept track of how much we were paying for water living in Coal Run, and then helped to figure out how much it would cost to bring water into town. Where did you get these numbers, Ms. Lewis? Just asking folks mostly. I go around door to door and ask how much they were paying for water, where they got their water from, all that jazz. What about information on how much it would cost to pipe water in? Well, the city of Zanesville was real upfront with us about that. I went up there and I asked for all of that information and they put me in touch with city planners and such and they gave me information on how much it would cost to bring water to Coal Run. They also told me how much it would, had cost them to bring water to other little towns. And what did you do with this information once you got it? Well, like I said, I just plugged it into some spreadsheets, took a bunch of averages. It's pretty simple stuff, the same way you might look at your finances to make a budget. And how much were residents of Coal Run paying for water, on average? It definitely varied a lot. Based on how much it rained, how many people were living in the house, all of that. But when it was all said and done, people in Coal Run paid somewhere around $800 to $900 a month for water. It was more than most people's mortgages. If they had paid for running water during that time, how much would they have paid? For the same amount of water? No more than $20. Most people would have paid closer to $30 or $35, though most people in Cold Run would use more water if they could afford it. Sure. That's a savings of what, $750 per household? Mm, actually, it's a bit more than that, because that doesn't include all the extra costs like water tanks, barrels, cisterns, upkeep or even transportation. All in all, it would probably have saved people close to a thousand bucks a month. That's why we kept going to the city and asking how much it would cost to get water piped in. Were you able to figure out how much it would cost to get water piped in? Yep. After talking to the planners and such, we figured out the total costs would be right around $700,000. Well, that does seem like quite a lot of money, Ms. Lewis, doesn't it? Not spread out over 150 homes. The cost per home was right around $5,000, about six months of water spending. And that was way less than the city was spending to send water to white neighborhoods. What do you mean exactly? Like I said before, I also got numbers on how much Zanesville was spending to send water to other areas. Sending water to Coal Run was a damn sight cheaper. Pardon my French judge. How much was the city paying to send water to other towns? Right around $9,000 per household. Almost double what it would cost to get water to us. What about total costs? If there were fewer homes, surely that means that the city would be spending less money overall, right? Uh, same number of houses about they'd be spending twice what they'd spend on us. Ms. Lewis, did the residents of Coal Run ever think about spending that money for themselves? We did. Most of us thought we shouldn't have to since the city managed to get more money or more funding than that for everyone else. But even with that in mind, people still thought about just doing it on our own, but the city wouldn't let us. They just made up excuses about why not, like, the water pressure would go down. It wouldn't. 
we'd have to dig through rock. They wouldn't. The, the cost, cost was, was too, too high. high. Your Honor, may I continue with my clothes? You may, sir. The cost was too high. It was. Which leaves one final item we need to discuss, members of the jury. Knowledge. Let's just go back and pretend for a second. Let's pretend the residents of Coron did prove that they had suffered real damages. Let's pretend the city of Zanesville was somewhere responsible for bringing water to those outside its city limits. Let's even pretend that there was enough funding to build all of the pipes and infrastructures necessary to supply Coal Run with water. Pretend for a moment, just a moment, that the plaintiffs managed to prove all this. Even if they proved all of that, members of the jury, they would still have failed in their case today. And that's because there was no way for them to prove the final element of their case. They had to prove that the decision makers of the city of Zanesville had knowledge that Coron wanted water lines. They had to prove to you that the city council members knew that Coron wanted water and chose not to provide it anyway. I'll remind you, members of the jury, that Coron is always away from Zanesville. Do you really expect the Zanesville City Council to know the thoughts and feelings of a random community miles away from their constituents? If they wanted to get water lines built, they had to go to Zanesville and make their voices heard. They knew what they were supposed to do. We will now hear from the plaintiff's fourth witness. When did you first start trying to get running water in Coal Run, Mr. Martin. Oh, I used to uh, I used to go to meetings with my with my parents. I was about five or six years old. Um, I've been to more meetings than I can count. And what meetings are you referring to? Um, Zanesville City Council meetings. People from Coal Run started going to those meetings in the fifties. It's been a long time trying to get Zanesville to provide water to Coal Run. And who would attend these meetings, Mr. Martin? Well, the city council would be there, of course. There'd be community leaders, um, residents of Zanesville, of course, always people from Coal Run. And then there were some people from smaller communities uh, around the area that would attend. And what was discussed in these meetings? Well, it, it changed from meeting to meeting. They would discuss um, trash collection, oh, whether or not to change a stoplight to a, uh, rather a stop sign to a stoplight. Sometimes they talked about Christmas decorations or ball games for the kids. Um, the only constant was that folks from Cold Run were always asking for water. And what exactly would you say? Well, we just go in and we'd say that you know we still wanted to have water provided, and we'd ask for an update. And how would the council respond? <laughs> well, at first they'd just say, "Well, we'll see what we can do." And as the years passed, they would tell us that they were aware of our concerns and were working on it. And eventually they started to say that it wasn't feasible at the moment, but they never explained why it wasn't feasible. And how often would you go to these meetings? Oh, about once every couple of months. And they never made any progress in all the years that you went? Well, never any real progress. I mean, they'd bait us every once in a while and make us think that things were going to work, and they get us all excited, and then they take our money. What do you mean they took your money? Well, every so often, they'd say that they were real close to getting the project started. Um, they just needed to secure additional funds. 
they'd say that if you paid a deposit that they'd guarantee that you'd be among the first people in Coal Run to have running water. They'd take your name, take a check, have you sign a clipboard, and then off you'd go. Nothing would ever happen and then you'd never see that money again. And how much did you pay in these deposits? Well, the deposits were $500, and they ran that scam on us for, I don't know, four or five years. Essentially, it turned out to be $2,000 down the toilet. And you said they took your name down? Do you have copies of the papers that you signed? Nope. And those clipboards would go with the city council members, and um, they take them with them, as well as our money. And do you know what information was on those papers? Well, our names, there were dates. Uh, we had to put our addresses down. And then there was a little box that we had to tick to um, say how much we'd be paying in deposits. And, um, oh yeah, there were signatures. Our signatures were on there. I'm going to show you a couple of documents, Mr. Martin, and I want you to tell the court if you recognize them. Your Honor, may I approach the witness with what's already been entered as, his, as Plaintiff's Exhibit 17? You may do so. Mr. Martin, do you recognize those documents? <laughs> well, I dog. Yeah, there's a couple of those uh, deposit sign-up sheets that are there. And that's me, and there's Joe Kennedy, and... This one's got Donna Lewis's name on it. And Mr. Martin, could you read for us the dates on these documents? Yeah, um, January 30th, 1979, June 13th, 1990, and this one's September 9th, 2004. Now, Mr. Martin, what made you stop working with the city to try to get water? Well, it became pretty clear that they weren't listening. A few years ago, I went into a council meeting and I raised my hand to speak and I told the council that we've been waiting a long time for water. I told them my mom was getting up there in age and I was hoping that she was gonna live to see running water and coal run. One of the council ladies looked me right in the eye and said, You'll be lucky if your grandkids' grandkids see water running in cold run. My mom passed year before last. Mr. Martin, do you think it's possible that you weren't clear in what the people of Coal Run wanted? Did you make it known what you wanted? Of course we were clear. Anyone who attended those meetings and said they didn't know that Coal Run wanted water they were either a liar or a fool. They knew what we wanted, and they took our money. They knew what they were supposed to do. They, they knew, knew what, what we they were, supposed were supposed to, to do. do. Your Honor, may I do my final close? You may. They knew what they were supposed to do. In the end, members of the jury, the decision rests in your hands. You have the ability to right this wrong. It's natural to want to be someone to blame, but cases like this rarely have clear-cut rights and wrongs. Might you disagree with some of the decisions made by the city of Zanesville? Yes. Yes, does that mean that the city is guilty of some sort of discrimination? We had no water. No, it's possible for reasonable people to disagree. It is unfortunate that the people of Koran have had to go without running water. Obviously. Yes, does that mean that the city of Zainsville be, should be blamed for them not having access to, access to water? Damn right. No, everyone agreed that this situation is unfortunate, but it should be clear after the testimony we've heard for the last few days that there isn't one party to blame. You've heard the reasons that you cannot find for the plaintiff in this case. The city had no knowledge of Coal Run's desire for city water. 
They knew we wanted water. The city did not have funding to bring water to Coal Run. They had more than enough funds. The city is not responsible for bringing water to townships outside of its city limits. They brought water to every other town in the area. The plaintiff was unable to prove damage was done. For these reasons, members of the, of the jury, the defense respectfully requests that you find the city of Zanesville not liable. 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 At this point, we are going to go to a scene where the attorneys are sitting around a table and they're talking, the group is tired, they seem somewhat disheveled, they're picking at Chinese takeout containers, imagine that, and rubbing their eyes, and you're going to hear about the discussions between that group. Chopsticks. I don't have any. <laughs> You'll have to do the best you can. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you were so confident in a verdict, you wouldn't have spent the last two weeks grumbling about Marbley's old decisions. I grumble about every judge's decisions. It doesn't, doesn't mean I didn't know we had them beat. Of course we had them beat. The whole closing was just a list of points that we dealt with during our case in chief. <laughs> it's not much, you can, what's he going to say, right? I mean, the city refused to give water to the only black neighborhood nearby. They just hoped nobody would notice? We noticed. Yeah, but how long did it take? Those people were waiting for water for the better part of 50 years. Still, we noticed. The city got just what they deserved. And now the residents of Coal Run get a paycheck big enough to never have to worry about water again. Never have to worry about anything. Uh, money doesn't spend like it, like it used to. 150 grand is nothing to sneeze at, Vince. I know, but still. It can't, I can't help but feel like the city got off easy. It's 2009, not 1889. People have, people have to know better than try and pass off discrimination as simple misunderstanding. If wishing made it so. You know better than anyone that this sort of thing still happens, Stefan. Speaking of which, we have to pick through the other cases on which to push first. I want a focus case on my desk by the end of business tomorrow. Come on, can't we have one day to celebrate? We've had one day, and this list of clients isn't getting any shorter. You got a favorite? I really like the case for the Cooks. Which one is that? James Cook. His wife's name is Debbie. Is that the refusal to rent? Refusal to sell. The seller agreed to deal with them until they saw that the James and Debbie were black. I truly don't understand. We had an agreement. We met the price. The bank gave us the go-ahead. What changed? Come on, James. Let's go. No, I won't let it go. Why all of a sudden we aren't good enough? People are going to feel how they feel, and it's nothing we can do about it. I'll be darned. We got the money. We got good credit. Three times a deal has fallen apart. We're going to move into this neighborhood whether they like it or not. 
promising. What else you got? There's Mr. and Mrs. Mahmoud Musa, who were guided by their realtor to a specific neighborhood. Did you see this one? They refused to show them anything in New Albany or Bexley, saying they'd fit in better in Hilliard. They insisted and said they'd have better uh, luck with another realtor. Um, Michael Rogers was told the apartment complex he was looking into didn't cater to people in wheelchairs and that it would be too hard for him there and he should try looking it up for Arlington instead. There's a potential class action in Reynoldsburg where a group of neighbors banded together to make sure that no houses were sold to immigrants because they were already too many Somalis and Nepalese in their area. Are we talking blockbusting? Yes. They put out, a, put out pressure on those who, in the area not to sell to immigrants, asking agents not to even bring people with certain last names. Well, that could be interesting. If you're looking for interesting, try Sarah Watson, 25, grad student at OSU. A landlord told her her lease would be terminated at the end of the month because she didn't believe in homosexuality. She's gay? Mm-hmm. Head of one of the gay straight alliances on campus. Yeah, but is that a protected class? Not federally. But there's still an argument to be made. Uh, definitely an argument. One I think we'd win. It's definitely interesting. I'm going to take a look at it tomorrow. I'm beat. I'm going to turn in for the night. Not a bad idea, boss. Yeah, and I have a couple of kiddos to get home to. You coming, Vince? Thank you.